Have you ever wondered where the problems in the world today would exist if we had deeper connection to ourselves, others, and the environment, and acted from that place? Welcome to the Conscious Action Podcast with your host, Brian Burneman, who believe that connection is the key to taking conscious action as individuals and creating a better world. We are here to raise awareness and inspire meaningful action by sharing stories, knowledge, and conversations with thought leaders and change makers. From sustainability to well-being and everything related to conscious living, our mission is to empower you to be the change that you want to see in the world. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Conscious Action Podcast. I am Brian Berneman, your host, and I have the pleasure to be joined all the way from Oregon in the United States by Neil Donald Walsh. Thank you so much, Neil, for being here, for taking the time to, to share with us. And for everybody that is listening and watching, I would love for you, Neil, to, to share a little bit about your your life and your journey before we get into what you do. Well, you know, I had to thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to be with you. It's lovely to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, I had kind of an interesting life, uh, Brian. I, I, be, I, in, I mean, as an adult, when I... All of us have interesting childhoods, and I had wonderful. I had a wonderful childhood. I have to say, wonderful parents, and all went well. Uh, and then I, I but I had a, like four or five different careers as I grew into my adult body. I started out in broadcasting, in radio broadcasting, when I was seventeen years old. That went on for well for quite a while, and I wound up dabbling in radio broadcasting, you know, until just a few years ago, actually, for for many many years. But as a full-time job, I went from radio to newspaper work. I became a newspaper um, journalist, a reporter, and then ultimately a managing editor in the newspaper business. And then I became a professional photographer. And so I, I started doing that for a while. So I've had, you know, and then I began my own company, Brian, in um, advertising and public relations. So I did. I've done a number of things. My point being that I did a, a lot of things in my life and made it a pretty nice living at them. I never had a problem. But here's where it got interesting. I I didn't understand why I wasn't happy as a person. I mean, I I was doing well. I wasn't walking around miserable, but I wasn't as happy as I thought I should be. And then. Uh, life hit me with what I call the triple whammy. At one point in my life, uh, my relationship with my wonderful wife broke down. And so we agreed to separate. And I was very sad about that because we had children that we shared. But I thought, okay, we'll, we'll do this. We, there's a way to do this you know, in a civil way, in a nice way. And we did. We had it, you know, we were civil with each other. But I found a little apartment. And then five days after we ended our uh, relationship, I lost my job. And through no fault of my own, the company was just downsizing, to use a phrase that's become popular. And so I, I wound up, you know, I was the last person they hired, so I was the first person out. I had no seniority. So now I, I lost my relationship and lost my job all within the same five days. But wait. Life wasn't done with me. Four days after that, while I'm in the car driving for another appointment with a job interview, I thought, well, I can get another job. Some elderly gentleman turned in front of me and smashed into my car. And I mean smashed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a fender bender. It was a major accident. My car was totaled and I broke my neck in the automobile accident. And Brian, it wasn't a a little you know, hairline fracture, I had a three-quarter inch avulsion fracture of the seven cervical vertebrae posteriorly. That's a break in your neck large enough to put a pen through. And when I woke up at the hospital, the doctor said to me, you understand that 90% of the people that come in here with that kind of a break in their neck die because of severe spinal cord injury. And if they don't die, the other 5% wind up paralyzed from the neck down. You have suffered neither. What do you intend to do with the rest of your life? 
Wow. You know, and I, I, I realized, oh my gosh, this is a powerful moment, obviously, in my life. So, you know, I, I, I wound up getting a little part-time job. I couldn't find full-time work right away, but I did find some part-time work, just enough to afford a little studio apartment above a garage in the back of somebody's uh, main house. Some rich people had a little a little garage in the back with an apartment on top, and so they rented it to me. And then I'm walking around, you know, with a Philadelphia collar, what they call a Philadelphia collar, which is a, a device, a plastic, a, a plastic a brace that holds your head up because you're, he, the doctor said, you must not take this off for at least a year and a half or two years. I don't care what you're doing. Do not take it off for any reason. You sleep with it on, you shower with it on, you make love with it on, you dance with it on. You do not take it off for any reason at all because it's the only thing holding your head up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Brian, I couldn't find work because nobody would hire me. Finally, one man told me the truth. He said, you know, Mr. Walsh, with that therapeutic device on your, on your neck, we, we, nobody's going to hire you because we all get that one wrong move and we're going to be wind up paying your insurance hospital bills or, you know, your health, health bills for, for, you know, for two years. We can't, can't do it. When, when that thing is gone from your neck, come on in because you have the credentials. We'd love to have you work for us. Mm. Like, so I couldn't find a job. I ran out of money. I wound up be, being asked by my landlord to even leave my little studio apartment. He said, I can't let you stay there for nothing. He did give me a couple of months. He was he was nice enough. But after three months, he said, hey, pal, I got to ask you to leave. Mm. I had nowhere to go, Brian. I wound up living on the sidewalk for a year. Not for a couple of bad weeks, not for a couple of tough months. I was out there on the sidewalk for a year of my life. And it, there's nothing that can wake you up faster than living on the outside, sleeping on the concrete, very cold in the city where I lived during the winter months. And I slept in the cold, in the summer, I slept in the rain. I had nowhere to go. And I literally had nowhere to go. I mean that literally in the sense I didn't even have anywhere to go to the bathroom. I had nowhere to, I had to sneak into restaurants and sneak into, you know, fast food joints and hope that the manager wouldn't throw me out because he obviously I wasn't going to spend any money in there. I had my hair down to the middle of my back. I didn't smell good. I looked terrible. I was on the street for a year. And I went from person to person with my hand out, Brian. If you could give me anything, anything, you know, anything helps. And now I see those people on the street with the same sign. They have cardboard sign, anything helps. And they mean it. You know, a nickel, a dime, a dollar. I don't know what the money is where you live, but where I live, you know, $5 is a lot of money for somebody on the street. Yeah. With, without a, And so once in a while, people would give me a little bit and hopefully by the end of the day, I could at least go to the fast fast food place and grab a hamburger and a bag of french fries. Mm. And I lived that way for a year of my life. That's right. what caused me to have my spiritual awakening. Because, Brian, I did get a little apartment again, a little one-room little one room place that I was able to afford. And I woke up one morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was... Screaming in my mind, okay, what does it take to make life work? Okay, okay, there's got to be, yeah, come on, I'm 55 years old. I wasn't a young man. I was 54, somewhere in there. And I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. I've got enough intelligence, enough creativity. I've, I've made a good living in my life, had several different careers. What is going on here? So you know what I did? I did something unusual. Just, just to get my feelings out, Brian, I sat down. There was a yellow legal pad on the coffee table in front of me, and I wrote an angry letter to God. I just literally wrote a letter to God. Dear God, what does it take to make this game work? I said, tell me the rules. I'm writing down, tell me the rules. I'll play the game. Just tell me the rules. How does it go? How does it work? And I said, and after you give me the rules, don't change them every five minutes. Because the world I was living in, it seemed like all the rules of life were changing every half hour. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this angry letter to God. And then I, 
I heard a voice. And there was nobody in the room. I thought, oh, great. Now, on top of everything else, I'm out of my mind. I'm hearing voices. But it was a very kind, gentle voice. And it simply said, Neil, do you really want answers to all of these questions? Or are you just venting? Hmm. And I'm saying to myself, hello, I am venting. But if you have answers, I'd sure as hell like to know what they are. And the voice said, wouldn't you rather be sure as heaven? You're sure as hell about a lot of things. Wouldn't you rather be sure as heaven? Mm -hmm. And I'm writing in my angry handwriting. I'm pressing down so hard you could read you know, what I was writing four pages deep. That's how, how hard I was pressing on the tablet. But I wrote, what's that supposed to mean? Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, Brian, I was involved in a question and answer dialogue with God. I mean, I was writing down everything I was hearing because what I was hearing was so unusual. It was so abnormal for me to, you know, to even imagine. So I was keeping a record. I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this down. This is fascinating. And I wrote down the answers to every question that I had asked and questions I never even dreamed existed. Mm -hmm. And I was given information, it, fantastic information, unbelievable stuff. There's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There are no victims and no villains in the world. And, you know, and, and, and many other you know, statements that directly contradicted everything that I ever believed or thought about life. But I kept a record of all. I never dreamt, by the way, that anyone would ever see this. This is, you know, this is personal. I was having, frankly, to be honest, what I felt was a very sacred experience. Once I got into it, I realized there's something really sacred happening here between me and me and my my version of God. But but then I was told in the dialogue, you will make of this one day a book, and it will have be accessed by many people. And you know what I thought, Brian? I thought, <laughs> now I got gotcha. you. Now I got gotcha. you. We'll see about that. Because that was a statement. Most of the other things I was hearing, Brian, were, you know, well, it could be, could not be theories. It's theoretical, conceptual in nature. But here is a statement of fact. You will make of this a book and it will be accessed by many people. I thought there's not a chance in the world. First of all, nobody's going to publish a book by a guy, you know, who says he's talking to God. I could see a publisher going out to the workroom floor saying to his editors, hold the presses. I got a guy here who's talking to God. It's not going to happen. You know, so I knew it. But you know what? There was a publisher who actually put, I sent it to a couple of publishers, my handwritten notes. I Xeroxed and went to the copying place and sent my notes to two or three, not, not 20 or 30, but two or three small publishers. By golly, one of those small publishers said, we want to put this out as a book. And they did. And I thought, you know, I couldn't believe it, but I thought, okay, it's going to sell like 500 copies. You know, some curious people might buy it, but it's not going to. 15 million copies later in 37 languages. We're here having this conversation on your podcast, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Neil, for, for sharing that. You know, there's. I, I always love hearing people's life stories, and I already knew yours based on I was fortunate enough that my parents gave me, when I was a teenager, gave me your your book, the the first conversation with with God book uh, part one, and I was like I couldn't put it down, and and I remember that I was seeing a lot of my own questioning in the questions that were in the book. Yeah, you know what? That's why the book. I realized later. That's why the book became so widely read. You know, I wasn't writing it as a book. It literally was a two-way 
on paper dialogue. I wasn't writing, trying to write a book. Mm -hmm. But the reason that the book became so wildly popular around the world, in 37 languages, Brian, in Japanese, in Russian, in Portuguese, in French, in Spanish, in German, you know, it was you know, even people in Australia could read it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but the yeah. reason but the reason is because what you just said, it turned out that I was asking the kinds of questions that everybody asks. Yeah. And yeah. but I was getting I was getting answers that hardly anybody got from any of their religions, any of their philosophies, you know, any of their cultural stories. The answers were different from the answers that everyone was getting. Yeah. So people like you, I'm not bragging, just saying, people couldn't put the book down. <laughs> yes, and you know, I I remember because the first one I read in Spanish, and and once uh, around that age was the time that I I got a really good understanding of English, and I thought, you know, I want to see what was this book in English. And it was quite similar, but always translations are slightly different. So I got the books in English and I started to read and I started to read all of them. And I think that I haven't read all of your books. I think that I read like 22, 23 of your books. Um, and, and I find a lot of times that what is mm, so good about the books and, and, and I would love to, to get your take on this is not only that there's great questions, it's very practical as well. It's for everyday life. It's not just, as, as you were saying, it's just theoretical things and things that I cannot implement in my life. This is things that I can actually implement in my life and things that as society we could potentially implement as well if we were willing. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, and Because what I was told in the book is that a spirituality which has no practical application is bankrupt. It's it's you know it's all very nice. It sounds good to the ear. It makes us feel good, maybe you know when we go to worship services once a week. But but how does it work on the ground in day to day life? But so what I was told in the dialogue is, Neil, I'm going to give you some very practical answers that can work in your daily life. Because a spirituality that's not practical, as, as I said, is bankrupt. This was said to me. Mm. So I'm writing this down. And I said, well, you know, I, can't, I can't disagree with that. And so it turned out that, yes, the answers that I was being given were very practical answers. And I began to apply them in my life. The most important answer I got was, by the way, uh, when I, I said to God, okay, can you just tell me in a simple paragraph or two, what what is it that I don't understand about how life works? You just just and God said, "Oh, sweetheart, it's so simple. You think your life is about you, and your life has nothing to do with you. It's about everyone whose life you touch, and the way in which you touch it." But when you understand that, then you will realize that in the largest sense, your life is about you because there's only one of us. So what you do for another, you do for you. And what you fail to do for another, you fail to do for you. Mm. And the fact that most people don't understand that is why the world is the way it is today. But once you understand that, watch your life change. Mm -hmm. And she was right. My whole life changed. I mean, everything changed. My income changed. I went from begging for pennies on the street to earning, a, frankly, a substantial amount of money from the sale of the books. My social life changed. I had been you know, kind of like awkward and selfish socially, very selfish as a person. And, but all that changed. My, my personality changed because I realized, oh, life, life is not about me. 
It's about everyone whose life I touch and the way in which I touch it. And believe me, that statement in, the, in that dialogue made me look at how I was touching other people's lives. I mean, what I was saying, the actual things I would say to people. And of course, what I was doing in my interaction with them and how I was behaving with other human beings. And all that changed. My re romantic relationship finally changed as well because I had one failed relationship after the other. But finally, I found out what could make a relationship work. And so even that changed. Mm -hmm. In fact, the lovely lady who's, who's my wife and has been now for 16 years, she actually proposed to me. And, you know, I, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that, that that's such a huge change because I was, you know, I was always the other way around. I was, I was trying to figure out how I could get, you know, somebody to be with me and stay with me and be my pal and be my life partner. And this lady looks at me in the car one day. We're driving down to the street, going to 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 the theater to see a, to see a play, and she looked at me in the front seat and she said, "You know what? I think we should be married." I almost dropped my teeth. I looked at her and I said, you don't want to say that to me twice. She said, no, I think we should be married. We like the same things. We have the same philosophy. We have the same you know, goals in life. We even like the same food. We even like the same music. We, and, you know, we're, we're, we, we have found that we are, you know, romantically uh, compatible. Well, I think we should be married. Hmm. And I said, shook her hand in the front seat of the car, and I said, done. And the next day, we flew off to Las Vegas uh, in the United States, which is a city where there's no waiting period. You can get a marriage license, and a half hour later, you can be man and wife. Hmm. Went to a wedding chapel, and we were married wow. just that fast. <laughs> that was 16 years ago. Wow. In September, we have our 16th anniversary. Now, for me, that's a, you, you have to understand, 16 years I may not seem like a lot for some people, but <laughs> that was a, 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 that's a record for me. I couldn't hold a relationship for more than a year and a half. Wow. With, with any, not, not a serious relationship. I was in one relationship after the other. Mm hmm but so everything in my life changed because I changed my whole understanding of who I am, why I'm here, what is the purpose of life, and even my whole understanding of God. If there even some people think there may be that isn't a God, but if there is a higher power, what's that all about? So I really changed everything. Mm. And you know, I even wrote a book ultimately called When, when Everything Changes, Change Everything. Yeah, based and on I, what I'm telling you. Yeah, and 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 I and I love that. I love the the a the possibility that we have for for changing changing once our perception changes when something touches us. Like and and for me that that's been a really important part of my life at least when something can touch me, and and it's that that feeling that. You know when you were saying in, in your conversation with with God before that it was like a sacred time. Like a lot of times for me, it like when something feels like that, that has such an an imprint that everything else in my life changes, and the way that I uh, that I am, the way that I belong, the way that I interact with others, it changes. And I love that we have that capacity that regardless of what has happened in our lives before we can change. And all that it takes sometimes is to listen to something or to hear something or to see something. And in this case, for you, it was with this conversation uh, with with God. And I, I would love, Neil, to, to explore about this that you just mentioned, God, a higher power. A lot of people in different religions, different ethnicities, different cultures have a different definition of God. What would be 
your definition of 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 the god that that you're talking about and and how do people um experience she him he, whatever they want to 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 talk about uh, god if there is such a thing well here you know what's interesting uh, brian uh, anthropologists over the past 10 years have taken surveys uh one question survey there's only one question on the survey where they've gone to almost every country in the world and asked people on the street a simple question do you believe in a higher power amazingly i i, I was quite surprised to find out that 85 percent of the people said yes they believe in a higher power they couldn't describe exactly what it is or what it was or what it does if it doesn't get what it was or any of that. But they did believe, you know, there's, there's more going on here than meets the eye. There is some kind of a higher power that, you know, started everything or created everything or is involved at some level in everything. Mm -hmm. So with 85% of the people believing in a higher power, I start to understand why the world is the way it is. Because here's another interesting statistic that you may not be aware of. There are 4,226 religions now being practiced on the earth. Not since the world began, but to this day, on this day, mm -hmm. over 4,200 religions and faith traditions being practiced on this planet right now. Each one with their own story about who is God, what is God, what does God want, what, do, what are you supposed to be doing, here are the rules, you know, like I said, in my angry letter, you know, the game keeps changing. You know, and, and it not only changes from day to day, but from religion to religion. Yeah. Some religions tell us what you're not supposed to eat, what you're not supposed to wear, what you should wear, what you have to say, and all the rest. So I finally realized that this is what's created the world's dilemma. Mm -hmm. That that 85% of the world's people believe in some kind of a higher power, but we don't have any idea what it was and how, how to use it, if, if it even can be used, and how to interact with it in a way that's going to please it enough and allow us to go back, hopefully, to heaven when we die, for those of us who believe in a life after death. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what's this all about? The old American song, what's it all about, Alfie? You know, so what's it all about? So I realized that this is what's created what I called the God dilemma. We don't understand. The first thing there is to understand about God. 85% of us believe there is some kind of higher power, but we can't agree with each other on what it is. We've, you know what? We've actually created wars with each other because we can't agree with each other about God. More wars, not all wars, but more wars have been started on this planet in the name of God than for any other particular reason. Check your history books. Yeah. So, which is you know, the irony of all time. So finally, I wrote a book called The God Solution which is my proposed solution to the God dilemma. And in the God solution, I suggest, you know, what we really need to do as a species, what humanity needs to do is to redefine God, to create a new definition of God, a definition on which we could all agree. Can, can that be so difficult? Isn't it possible for us to all agree on one definition of God? Mm -hmm. So I proposed a two-word definition of God. Let's decide that God is pure love. Now, Brian, when I say that in front of an audience, somebody inevitably gets up in the back of the room and says, oh, Neil, 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 if I've been listening to you for 25 minutes for you to tell me that your big revelation is that God is love, everyone knows that God is love. Even, even religions that disagree with each other about doctrine and dogma, they all agree that God is love. 
That's your big secret. And I have to say to them, whoa, whoa, relax, relax. I didn't say God is love. That's not what I said. Yes, it is. I just heard you say that. I said, no, you didn't listen carefully. I said, God is pure love. Hmm. Now my friend in the back of the room will say, okay, what's the big difference? The difference is that pure love needs nothing. Yeah. Expects nothing. Hopes for nothing. And demands nothing in return. Dare we believe in a God who is that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Dare we believe in a God who is that incredibly wonderful? A God who needs, demands, expects, and requires nothing in return for the gifts that he gives us mm -hmm. every moment of our life. Brian, we can't even love the person on the pillow next to us mm. that way. Much less the people across the street or around the world. We, we've created a world of alienation. Alienation like I've never seen in my life before. Mm. Even when I was younger, it wasn't this bad. Mm. But now... We have alienation is the way things are. Nations alienated from nations, races alienated from races, people of every stripe and color. I mean, if there's any difference between us, they're wrong and we're right. Yeah. Whatever it is, gays and straights, men and women, rich and poor, black and white, you know, Christians and non-Christians, you know, whatever. Mm. If you're not the same as me, you're wrong, and I'm right about, by the way, everything. Mm. Now, I hope you understand this is true, incidentally, because if you don't agree with everything I've just said, then mm. you're the problem. People, It's people like you, mm -hmm. media people, mm. who do interviews on podcasts. You're the problem. Mm. If you stop creating the problem that you're creating with this nonsense that you share with people, the world would be a better place. That's the kind of world we've created. Yeah. And you know why, Brian? Let me tell you why we've created that kind of a world. Because we think that's what God does mm -hmm. in his behavior with us. Yeah. Oh, we say that God is love. Yeah, God loves us. But God is also judgmental condemning mm -hmm. and punishing. Mm -hmm. And so since religions teach us that we should be acting like God, imitating God-like behaviors, we think it's also okay for us to be judgmental, condemning, and punishing. And brother, are we ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we become judgmental, condemning, and punishing of each other because that's how we think that God is with us. But if you pull that rug out from under that, if we suddenly decide that God is not judgmental, condemning, and punishing of us, we've lost all of our justification. Mm -hmm. What if we said that we are what God is? Wouldn't it be interesting if we embraced the God solution, which suggests that we are made of the same stuff? that God put in each one of us pure love. Mm. Yes. How beautiful and different the world would be if we actually had that belief. And I, I often share, you know, with everyone that I talk about that understanding on how our beliefs shape a lot of our world and then as you're saying then we create this separation and we alienate and when we judge if someone is not doing things in my way 
And I've been blessed enough that I, through travel and through um, different books and different stories and different practices, I've been able to actually connect with those that are different than me. I mean, everyone is different than me, <laughs> but those that my society told me that they are different. And, and I remember when I was a kid uh, back in Argentina, and I grew up within a Jewish family, and the and the country is a Catholic country. And I remember seeing this person that during the week he was acting like a really you know really bad. He was always doing all of these things that I would consider you know like to be really uh, an excuse the word an asshole. And then on Sunday he would go to church and he would ask for forgiveness and then he would go back to the rest of the week and he would act in this way again and i couldn't reconcile the idea that uh, you know like there's this difference of how you know on on sunday he would behave and how he would ask for forgiveness and then how he would behave the entire day and this is for me one of the things that when i hear you talking about that pure love is understanding that we are all one and what i am doing to me and what i am doing to you i am doing to me what and everything and if we could change that perception of not thinking that there is this judgment or this difference and separation how how could we be with each other how can we hold each other and how different the world could be because i see the world as a beautiful space as a beautiful like speck on on the universe that i am so uh, like appreciative of and that i'm so lucky to to be alive in this precious life and how can i make the most and live my grandest version of myself By doing exactly that, by in fact living the grandest version of yourself. Mm. You know, differences do not have to create divisions. Mm. Contrasts do not have to create conflicts. We, we can celebrate the differences between us and even differences with which we disagree we can find a way, if we choose to be a civilized person, to disagree agreeably. To simply say, you know, I don't share the same point of view as you are, as you do. Uh, I don't agree with some of the behaviors that I see you exhibiting. But it's not going to cause me to make you my enemy. I don't need to attack you verbally or even physically because of your lifestyle or your point of view. But you know, we live in a time right now where I don't know how it is in your country, but in the United States, we have people running for public office, holding major high level public office. And in their campaigns, they actually insult each other. I've never seen this. When I was a young man, that never happened. Mm -hmm. But now, people who are running for president are on television verbally insulting and bullying the other candidates. Yeah. We call insults and bullying leadership. We call that leadership now. So, you know, so something's happened. Mm -hmm. so, something's, something's happening to humanity. But I think that we have an opportunity to turn it around. If we can bring people another idea mm -hmm. about who we are and about how we could interact with each other in a way that can change the way the world is now presenting itself. We have an opportunity to do that. And the opportunity is greater now than it ever was, Brian, because of of events like this very program, this very podcast. 
you know, even 10 years ago, to think we could get on a, 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 a square box in the corner of our living room and talk to people around the world, thousands of people at one time, would have been science fiction. It would have been literally science fiction. But now we can actually do that. So we have even the average individual has the ability to talk to hundreds, if not thousands of people, and change the collective understanding mm -hmm. of who we are and why we are here. I'd like to offer a final thought about that in terms of why we are here. See, I think there's a question most people have never asked themselves, which is, who am I? I mean, really, who am I? I don't mean, what kind of person am I? I mean, actually, who am I? Am I simply a physical specimen, a physical entity? You know, like a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea? Just you know, another physical life form? Or is it possible? Just possible that I'm a spiritual entity having a body and having a mind. But what if this is not really who I am? What if these are just pieces of equipment that who I am, the soul of me, uses to complete its agenda? Now, if that were true, when, by the way, excuse me, but every spiritual master on the planet, I'm not one of them, but all those who we call spiritual masters have said this. They've already told us exactly that. You are not a physical being like a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea. You're a spiritual entity using your physical expression in order to complete the agenda of the soul. And what is the agenda of the soul? We've come to the realm of the physical to announce and declare, express and fulfill, to become and experience who we really are as demonstrations of divinity. We are, in fact, each of us an individuation of divinity. Now, we, we come here to the physical world because in this environment, there exists what we are not. In the realm of the spiritual, all there is is love here and now all the time. It's, I mean, really is paradise. It really is heaven. People who say that that's heaven, they're, they're correct. But in the physical realm, there is this and there is that. There is up and there is down. There is fast and there is slow. There is big and there is small. There is evil and there is good. Or to use a simple metaphor, there is light and there is dark. If I want to know myself as the light, I can do that in the realm of the spiritual. But if I want to experience myself as the light, I have to go someplace where there is something that is not the light. Because I can't express the light when I'm in the midst of the light in heaven, you know, it's like a candle in the sun. You're there all right, along with 50 kajillion other candles, but you can't experience yourself being the light. If you want to actually be the light, you would have to find yourself in a place where there is what? Ah, oh, the darkness. Mm -hmm. I see. Therefore, raise not your fist to heaven and curse the darkness not but be a light unto the darkness that you might know who you really are and that all those whose lives you touch might know who they really are as well. Which means that we could even, dare I say it, bless, bless, bless your enemies. And pray for those who would do you evil. Mm -hmm. And do good to those who would do bad things to you. And if a man asks you for your coat, give him your shirt as well. Mm -hmm. And if a man demands 
that you walk one mile with him. Go with him to me. Mm -hmm. An interesting guy said this about 2,000 years ago. Of course, they hung him up on a cross. How dare you speak that way to us? And he's not the only one who said words like that. Muhammad, bless his holy name, Moses, Buddha, I mean, and men and women throughout the years, Catherine of Genoa, read the words of Julian of Norwich, Teresa of Avila, men and women throughout the ages have already given us this information. Mm -hmm. Let those who have ears to hear, listen. Mm -hmm. But now we have a chance to make it happen because we have the opportunity to talk to thousands of people, just as you're doing right now with this interesting program that you've decided to put on the internet mm -hmm. and inviting crazy people like me to say crazy things like this, to see if maybe one or two people might agree. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Neil, for, for sharing that. Like, uh, you know, as, uh, as you're saying, when, when we share them, we can touch others. Um, that's just something that, as you were just saying, that that, that really touched and, and moved me. So thank you for, for sharing that. And, and thank you so much for for the, the work that you keep on doing on on spreading this, these messages so that more and more people awaken to a potential of a new new world and a new and different way of, of living that comes from that space of pure love and not that judgment or that fear that a lot of us have based our beliefs from. So thank you so much. <laughs> those are kind words. Thank you for saying those nice words to me. And also, I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to share this time with you. Beautiful. Thank you, Neil. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. As always, if anything resonated with you or if you have any questions or comments to share, please do so anywhere that you're finding this episode. And for now, thank you so much, Neil, once more. And everybody for listening to this episode. Bye. Bye for now. Bye for now. What did you like the most about this episode? Take a moment to think about what change you can make in your life today. Share your conscious action on social media using hashtag conscious action and tagging at conscious action and said so we can celebrate your impact on the world and create a ripple effect. One easy action we would love for you to take right now is to share, like and subscribe to this podcast. This will help us get these messages out into the world and inspire more people to take conscious action in their own lives contributing to the better world we hope for.